It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. So why the, why the name Turf Flinging Monkey? Well, I actually made a, one of my subscriber specials. I think it was 2000. Mm. Basically, it's a funny name, primarily. I thought it would be a funny, interesting name. Uh, also, it's, very, it's, like a, it's like an onion. There's many layers. So the first most superficial layer is that it's a funny name. The second layer is that <laughs> humans and apes are the only two animals that I know of that when they're put in captivity will throw shit at you. A lot of animals are just really stupid and, you know, you lock them in a cage. As long as you feed them, they're happy. But primates are really smart. And when they're locked in cages, they know they're locked in cages. And so in protest, they'll fling poop at you. So if you think about, you know, the way society is, it's very misandric, favoring women, um, treating men like disposable utilities. You know, what can we do? You know, we have no, we don't, we can't call the shots. So all we can do is just fling feces, just like the primates in a zoo. How long have you been in MGTOW? Um, I was like, I guess, passive in the community for about a year, year and a half. I discovered MGTOW through Sandman, but I discovered Sandman from a, like a Sargon video. You know how YouTube has the suggested videos? Yeah. So I kind of like stumbled down the rabbit hole and kind of discovered MGTOW that way. I was kind of passive. I, you know, I commented on videos for a while and it was like Martin Luther King day this year in January. I just had the day off of work and I was like, screw it. I'll make a video and see how it goes. And then I made it and I uh, contacted a couple of the channels that I was just, you know, that I liked, I respected. And I just said, Hey, I made a video. Can you give me some pointers? Tell me what you think. And like raging golden Eagle plugged it the next day. And I got like 150 subs my first day. The, the, the deepest, darkest layer of the onion of why my name is so brilliant in my mind is beyond the, how it's funny and beyond the, the deeper meaning of it, you know, a, a primate chap, trapped in a zoo. There, this is the best part. Okay. When you're dealing with feminists and social justice warriors, their go-to tactic is the ad hominem attack. So, you know, you can't use logic and reason with them because they just accuse you of being – some kind of ist. You're a sexist, racist, homophobic, Islamophobic, phobic and ist all over the place. <laughs> they attack you as a person. When you have a name like Turd Flinging Monkey, they don't have anything to work with because any kind of insult they can come up with is just going to sound endearing. Hmm. Uh, like actually, you know who Kevin Logan is? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. he, he made a video about me a while ago. And he was trying to make fun of me. So he was, he was trying to make, come up with like uh, insulting variations of my name. So he called me uh, Turdykins, uh, Turd Boy. So I, but like all those names sounded like he was my buddy. You know, like none of those names came off as insult because my name is already Turd Flinging Monkey. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I completely disarm you of the ad hominem attack. Because you can't, make, you can't make fun of my name. You can't, like, so what are you left with? You're not, you, you actually have to talk about my arguments. You can't just insult me because I've already insulted myself. I give myself a ridiculous name. <laughs> have you been a MGTOW before you call yourself a MGTOW? I, well, I, yeah, I didn't know what MGTOW was. I mean, I, I, had a, I had, you know, my own kind of code and my own philosophy. I didn't. I didn't have a name for it. It was just what I believed. And, you know, I discovered MGTOW and it's kind of like it built on itself. Like I, I kind of, uh, I dabbled in like the PUA and the MRM for a little bit. Uh, I didn't, you know, some of it I liked, some of it I didn't. Uh, and then when I found MGTOW, it's like, oh, this is where I belong. You know, it's like, cause you don't know when you're trying out different groups you like you like this part of this group, you like this part of this group, and then you find the group that fits you and you just know your home. And can you go over about what happened to you when you were like a PUA? Well I wasn't I wasn't a PUA. Oh, I was okay. Trying, <laughs> uh, I, I dabbled in like some of their content. Uh, okay. it was mostly 
trying to understand human nature. Uh, mm-hmm. I, mean, I, could, I, I talked about my, uh, my story with I Am Serious in the interview back in the day. I can go over it again. I don't know if you've seen that video. I know I haven't. Okay, so it's, it's a long and sordid tale. If I had a violin, I would play it for you while I, while I uh, said it. <laughs> long story short, um, I've had a few serious relationships, and I was cheated on by pretty much all my girlfriends. Pretty much every girl that I had strong feelings for and thought was the one cheated on me. Um, and oh, before that, this is important. Um, I was abandoned by my mother when I was like 12. Wow. So I was raised by so – oh, I didn't make this clear when I in my first interview. I wasn't abandoned like in the street. I was raised by my grandma and grandpa after my mom abandoned me. Mm. Um, Anyway, but I did – that that really messed me up. I had, like, severe abandonment issues for obvious reasons. Um, so – That's was, really strange, like, because, like, usually you hear stories about people getting banned from their fathers, not their mothers. Well, I didn't – I have no memories of my father and mother even being married. They got divorced when I was so little alive together. So I was raised by a single mom, and she – I have four siblings. They all have different fathers. Um, so my mom basically raised us on child support and welfare and she spent mm. it all, she spent it all on herself. There's actually, okay, this is a fun anecdote. It's kind of disgusting, but I can laugh about it now. So, uh, my mom actually took us well, there's this hostess outlet by our house where I was growing up and she drove us down there, but she made us stay in the car when she would go get Twinkies and she always went around the back. She never actually went to the front door. <laughs> <laughs> So I always thought like that was kind of weird. I thought maybe she got the hookup. Someone was like holding something for her. She came back with these boxes of Twinkies. And that's what we would eat. That was like our treat. And <laughs> I didn't, um, so then I went, when my mom, when my mom abandoned me, I went to go live with my grandma. We went and bought Twinkies at the store and we took them home. I opened them. I bit into it. And it was like all spongy <laughs> and the, the, the frosting was fluffy. I was like, mm-hmm. something's wrong with these Twinkies. They're too soft, and the, the, the frosting is too too fluffy. She's like, that's what Twinkies <laughs> are supposed to taste. So, yeah, it turns out my mom was dumpster diving to get expired Twinkies, and that's what she was feeding us so she could basically spend our child support and welfare money on herself because she never had a job. Wow. So she was a piece of work. Um, anyway. That's crazy. But, yeah, I know. So, But anyway, I was like a total simp. Uh, like I really just, I, I, I wanted the Nawalt. I, I went unicorn hunting for many, many years and I tried everything. I tried dating, you know, the nice girls, the religious girls, the conservative girls, the liberal girls, like any type of girl that I thought would be, I went to where I thought the good girls were and I would date the girls that I thought were the good girls and they were all the same. So I ended up dating like way below my standards. Like I, when I was in high school, I would date like cheerleaders and I went on <laughs> stuff like that. Um, but I got sick of being cheated on. I really wanted, I just wanted someone who would stay loyal to me and just, I wouldn't have to worry about. So I dated this girl who was so fat, she waddled. <laughs> um, but she, she had a cute face. So I figured she was a fixer upper. And I was, you know, I'm like, okay, she's got good genes uh, because her family's good and she's got a cute face. So, you know, because it's not like fat isn't, you don't inherit fat. So, you know, she just didn't have any discipline. She had a lot of emotional problems. Right. So she was my fixer upper. I'm like, I'm going to turn this one into a Nawalt. I didn't even know what a Nawalt was, but I'm just using the, the today's terminology. So I, uh, I really loved her. Like I gave her that like romantic you know chick flick kind of love where I, I made her feel good about herself and i was there for her. and even though like i was a lot more attractive than her and she knew it <laughs> uh i was so i was incredibly loyal to her and all I, I i and but so she started to feel better about herself i helped her work through her emotional problems and she started to lose weight so i'm like perfect this is exactly what i want because I saw, <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, like that movie, She's All That. I was actually partially yeah. inspired by that movie, that Freddie Prince Jr. movie, but from like the 90s. So I figured I'm going to be nice to this girl. I'm going to care about her. I'm going to love her. And I'm going to help her with her emotional problems. And because, and once she loses the weight, because I saw the potential underneath the, 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 
the comforter of fat she was wearing under her <laughs> I, I saw all of that it's going to be there for help her work it out. It, it, it worked, you know, like we dated for about a year and a half and she was, she started looking really good. Um, we were happy. I was happy. I thought she was the one. And because she started to look good, other guys started paying attention to her. And she never had guys paying attention to her because she was always overweight pretty much her whole life. So long story short, she cheats on me too. Wow. And at that point, that was that was the straw that broke the camel's back. That was like my, my moonshot. So it was like your fuck you moment to women, right? Yeah, I was like, because, you know, before that, I tried like girls who said they were religious and girls who said they were virgins and the born again whores. And I tried <laughs> all I tried all the girls that I thought were going to be the good ones that wouldn't cheat on me. And then this was like all right, I'm going to build a girl. Like I, I can't find a girl. So I'm going to make one. So that's when I found this fatty who had a <laughs> decent face and I was going to make her the girl I wanted. If I could find one that was already ready made, I would make one myself. And even that blew up. Even she cheated on me. And <laughs> so then when we broke up, she got fat again. And then she, <laughs> like, and she, and she actually stalked me for years. She's like, she found my phone. She like because she she knew she fucked up. <laughs> she knew she fucked up. Like when when we broke up, like I think it hit her. Like she thought, like oh, all these guys are giving me attention. Tee hee, I'm like I'm hot now. Um, she didn't know how good she had it because I guess she didn't really have any serious relationships until me. Um, but after she got out there and basically other guy, all these guys she she was cheating with basically treated her like shit. And then she realized, like, oh, my God, I threw away this guy. And he was, like, so good to me. And he was so, you know, like – and I'm, like, good-looking, successful. Like, I had everything going for me. I could have done much better than her physically. But I actually wanted someone who I could trust. And she fucked that up. So mm. she she got fat, started stalking me. <laughs> um, so every couple years, I'd get a message or I'd get a phone call out of the blue. And like, I even changed my number and she would find me somehow. Like if I told, like if I told one of my friends back home, like, cause I joined the military later. If I mm. told one of my friends, my new contact number, it would somehow get to her and then she would call me, you know, and I was still, I was still in my twenties. So I still wanted to get laid. And that's kind of like what led me to the PUA stuff. Cause I'm like, I'm just going to use women. You know, I'm sorry, I got to get the poison out. That's all they're for. I'm not looking for a relationship. I'm not looking for the one. Fuck it. I'm just going to get my dick wet. And um, <laughs> I'm going to keep my dick nice and moisturized. And then I'm going to move on with my life. Um, you know, and, and that's kind of faded, especially the more I've gotten involved with MGTOW. And I'm, because, like, I, I kind of, I don't even, it's not worth it. It's like, like uh, you know, Barbarossa is, right? Yeah, I heard of him on the other day by uh, UBS. He's one of the big, big guys. It's like the granddaddy of MGTOW. Hmm. But uh, one of his like trademark qu- quotes is, "The juice isn't worth the squeeze." So <laughs> that's like where I. That's the conclusion I came to. You know, I'll meet a girl. We'll go out. I'll take her out on like two or three dates. You know, let's say Olive Garden. I spend sixty dollars, thirty for her, thirty for me. We have a good time. I have a good meal. Uh, second or third date, go back to her place, have a good time, you know, whatever. But, but I spent probably a total of 15 hours on this girl, $120 in meals, not to mention gas, not to mention tips, alcohol, you know, so bringing a bottle of wine to her place, that sort of thing. So, I mean, I probably spent a good $200 and like – several days because it's not just going on the date it's also preparing for the date all this other shit and it's like just to get laid it's just not worth it and then you have you know call girls you get the you get obviously you get down to business a lot quicker but you're spending more money so it's like because it starts at two hundred dollars and that's just for like a hand job with a condom on (laughs) it's like shit you know just just to get a decent just to get a decent dick moisturizing, you're going to spend probably like 300 bucks. Have you ever considered prostitution? No, I'm, I'm paranoid about STDs. Right. 
Um, and I don't, I don't like wearing a condom, so I prefer blowjobs. Okay. When I get, when I put a condom on, like I don't feel anything. It's like there's a barrier. There. There's literally a barrier there between me and the friction, and mm. it's it's harsh and mellow. Okay. So yeah, I, but you know, but the thing about it is, like you know, you get a blowjob from a hooker. She's probably got shit going on in her mouth. She yeah. Give you herpes. You know. So fuck that. So, I mean, call girls are usually good because they're just, like, college girls. So, you know, they're, they're trying to pay their student loans or something. Like, fuck, you could suck my dick. Why, why not? But <laughs> it's so much money. But then going on dates, you save money, but you spend way more time. And then, like, um, my horm- your hormones kind of – I mean, how old are you? In your 30s or in your 20s? I'm 22. Okay. So you'll notice once you hit your 30s, <laughs> your hormones will settle down. It's kind of like – it's like reverse uh, puberty, you know, like – you know, when you hit puberty and all of a sudden you discover girls and right. you know, yeah. just, you know, you're jerking off like five times a day, like, right. you, know, <laughs> you, yeah. so you got to drop out. So it's like that, but in reverse, you know, your, your hormones will level off and you'll just realize sex is nice, but there's a point to where it's not worth it. There's, it's, it's too much bullshit. Like, you know, if you have, if you're in a relationship and if she's there and you can just bend her over and start fucking her. Cool. Go for it. But it's like, do I really want to spend 15 hours of my life and almost $200 to go on these dates for a couple minutes of friction when I could just (laughs) jerk off? Like, I can go to Pornhub, pull up a video, rub one out, and I'm good. Right. (laughs) It's almost as if it's much more easier to just look at porn than to just try to date. Yeah, it's a lot easier. And it's like, the thing is, is, you know, in a in the perfect world, women would offer more than that, but they literally offer nothing else. Like they offer their moist holes, and that's it. And sometimes, like the worst, the worst is when you go out with a girl. She's hot. You're like, oh man, this is gonna be great, and she just lays there. She lays there and makes noises while you do all the work. And it's like, you know what? If I wanted to fuck a flashlight, <laughs> I don't have one in my house. <laughs> I'm not. I'm basically using your body as like a masturbatory aid. You're not even doing anything. Of course, I don't say that. I'm like, well, you know, it's this or nothing. I worked hard for it. I'm, Damn it, I'm going to take it. But it's just really depressing when girls just lay there with their legs open just and they just like do nothing. It's everyone's friend. It's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare as you should be aware He smiles like Richard Pryor so just sit and stare It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler